We want to welcome you here in the room and online. What a privilege. If you're sitting with us today and you're on the end of the row, if there's room in the middle, feel free to scoot in and keep whatever space that you need. Let's read Psalm 117. Oh, praise the Lord. All you nations, praise him, all you people, for his mercy and loving kindness are great towards us. And the truth and faithfulness of our God endures forever. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. We are the grateful choir, joining believers all over the world because our God, yes, he reigns. It's the song of the forgiven. Rising from the African plains It's the song of the forgiven That's us Drowning out the Amazon rains The song of Asian believers Filled with God's holy fire Every tribe, every tongue, every nation A love song born of a grateful choir It's all God's children singing glory, glory Yes, hallelujah, he reigns He reigns It's all God's children singing glory sound let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground from all the songs and from the dawn of creation some were meant to persist of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples None ring truer than this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns in all the powers. All the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. When all got children sing our glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, saw God people singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, it's all God's people singing glory, glory. good to be a child of God. Each person here that has accepted that free gift of salvation, there's been a miracle that's gone on in your heart. You've been turned from death to life. 
Our God is a God of miracles, amen. Let's sing about getting changed because of Jesus. I search the world. It couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Sing with us. When you came along, and you put me back together Oh, and every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord there's Nothing is better than you. Oh, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountains Is the God of the valley Oh, and there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again
And if you're here today and you think the miracle can't be in my life because I've gone too far, it's too hard and I'm stuck, just take that first step. Come as you are. There's no sin that's too great that can keep you from the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ladies, lead us out. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let the rescue begin. Come find your mercy, or sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow, and heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow, and heaven can't heal. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wonder, come home, you're not too far. Lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So let's lay it down. So lay down your burden. So lay down your shame. Oh, who are inviting it to come and pierce us, to lay us open, to be completely humble so that we can know of your grace and your mercy. And it starts with this. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all. 
to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. And I surrender all. And nothing back take an inventory right now what bitterness what pride what is it that is keeping you from fully giving yourself over today let's give it to him all to Jesus I surrender humbly humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsake. Take me, Jesus, take me, Jesus, take me now, and I surrender. our prayer just our voices and I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender Maybe seated. Will you join me in prayer? Good morning, Father. What a lovely sound that was. It's so good to be together and talk to you in this moment. I was reading this past week a statement that said, I only pray when I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble all the time. I pray all the time. And I've been thinking about that because of the trouble that I have seen in my own life this week that I willingly bring to this world and the added trouble I've seen around me. Father, is there enough mercy for someone like me to come boldly to your throne in this moment as that old hymn invites? Is there enough mercy for someone like my husband to come to you, my four children, my parents? Is there enough mercy for Matt, his wife, Leslie, to come to you. Is there enough mercy for everyone joining us online and in this space here to come to you boldly right now? What about enough mercy for every resident of the United States? Father, that's a lot of mercy. What about for every person in our church family who said goodbye to someone this week? They will never celebrate another birthday with them. They will never sit on a couch and say, tell me about your day. They will forever grieve a relationship with someone they loved. Is there enough mercy for those of us who battle illness, 
who suffer in our own skin are debilitated, in pain, full of discouragement. Father, is there enough mercy for Jason and Lisa Hoving, our global partners for so long? We love them and they love us for their boys, Andrew and Aaron, for their daughter, Laura, and their new son-in-law, Mitch, who we have all been so encouraged by their love and union this summer. Jason and Lisa are getting ready to take off for their new location, and there are so many details that need to go into a change like this. Traveling internationally in our world today, there's a lot of decisions to be made, let alone new connections and invitations to bring your good news to this world. Lord, is there enough mercy for what you've called them to do? Well, we come together as a family right now, and we take our eyes off of ourselves, and we joyfully look to Jesus, and we can collectively say, yes, 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 new mercies, everlasting, abounding for every single one of us in this moment. We celebrate this because it is not of our doing, and it is only because of you. And so we thank you, and we ask you to be near us in this hour, and we do so in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. My name is Bryn, and I am so glad to be with each of you this morning. I'm part of the team here at Magnify, and I work with anything related to children. And this fall, we're telling stories to your children about the life of Jesus. And last Sunday, I was talking to a five-year-old, and she wanted to tell me what she was taught about the story. And so she described with detail the setting that Jesus had entered, which was a space that had been set aside for the most pure and the most strong love of the Father. And so Jesus entered this space, and there were people of power taking advantage of others, lying to them, and taking more of their money than they ought. And she paused in her storytelling, and she looked off, and she said, and then? Jesus got mad, and it was the right kind of mad. If you're a guest with us, welcome. So good to have you. If you're joining us online, so good. Thank you for sharing your Sunday morning with us. We want to connect with you, of course. Yes, we do. We want to know about your story. We want to know what kind of pie you crave in late September in glorious Western Michigan, of course. But mostly, we want you to know about Jesus, who's the right kind of everything. And that's far from our own experience here with one another at times. But we know our hope comes from having a relationship with him because he sees how we get it wrong and wants to be close with us anyway. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we are a rescued people, and it informs everything we do here on a Sunday. Please see this website to understand more of what we have available Sunday mornings at all of our locations. Next, Matt Zania, our lead pastor, will be coming to teach to us about his series of being light in the darkness and how us as a church can bring hope to this world because of our relationship with Jesus. And then at night, we have opportunities for further connection, for community, and for learning, for classes of people of all ages. Again, the website here will help with that. Do you know when you give financially to this church, you're coming alongside a five-year-old, and you're giving them an imagination for someone who loves them and is the right kind of everything. Thank you for being so generous.
Good morning. If you have a Bible with you, please turn to the book of Philippians chapter 2. And in just a moment, I'll begin reading at verse 1. Quick reminder, <clears throat> we're in the middle of a six-part series on three key topics, race, pandemic, and politics. And so today we are talking about how to be a light in the darkness and caring in the midst of a pandemic. So if you'll follow with me, beginning at verse one of chapter two in Philippians. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Well, a quick reminder also of our series format. With each of the three topics, I'm going to do a teaching the first week, and then the second week, I'll interview somebody uh, that uh, will help give us a more personalized uh, light on the topic we're on. So this week, I'm teaching on uh, the pandemic and caring to, in the midst of a pandemic. But I wanna remind us all of our overarching scripture for the series, which is also Philippians 2. And it comes <clears throat> right after the section I just read. And one of the key verses in there says this, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So this is over all of them. In fact, uh, just as this morning, as I was thinking about uh, why are we doing this series, it's in this verse why we're doing this series. Uh, don't be uh, given to complaining and grumbling. Uh, so what motivates a series like this? Well, huge topics that are very confusing create a lot of fear and anger, but also stir up a lot of grumbling and complaining. Uh, but Paul is telling us in this passage, look, don't do that. You're the church, you're Jesus Christ personified. And that is personified in your unity together. And we're to turn a light on for the world when things get dark. And grumbling and complaining and posturing and feeling proud and insightful over others. That has no place. So we're here for a job to do. And the job of the church changes as things are going on, uh, at least the surface, how it's manifested changes. The essence of it is the same. And today, uh, we're as we talk about the pandemic, we think about this pandemic and it's, it's brought a, a lot of change to our lives, change in our behaviors, change in how we talk, a change of how we think, change of things that are becoming commonplace in what we see and experience. And it changes some of the things we know and do. There's a look at our uh, expanded abilities. I mean, think of our vocabulary. Who knew this word a year ago? Comorbidity. Or how about this one? Hydroxychloroquine. Unless you've been somewhere where there's malaria and you had to take medicine for it, you probably a year ago didn't know that word. And so our, our uh, vocabulary has increased. 
Our math and statistics skills have increased. Infection rates. We look at graphs all day and we uh, see ratios and ra uh, um, uh, different statistics that are telling us how much uh, sickness is around us and per capita and all those things. How about our geography? We all know Wuhan is a real place and it's in China. And how about our civics? We know a governor can have executive orders and they have real consequences on our life. So there's all this stuff going on, but unfortunately one of the main things that it's changed in us or affected us is it's raised our level of fear and raised our level of anger. How do you do with this? How's your fear level? How's your anger level? A lot of our anger is motivated by fear. So uh, we're going to talk about this this morning and, and next week. And there are three things at the start of the teaching uh, that I want us to remember. And then I'll hit a few more near the end. First of all, it's real. When we think about the pandemic, there are all kinds of theories out there. And <clears throat> but there are real people who have gotten sick from a disease that wasn't amongst us a year ago. And some of them have died. And whether it's touched your life or not, you probably know somebody whose life it has touched. And I know I was out with a guy yesterday. He lives over other side of town in Wyoming. And he was telling me about uh, four people he knows from his life and his neighbor's life who passed away. And, and they weren't, uh, before this uh, pandemic came, they, there was no indication that they were near death. It's real. Now we can dispute how they count this, that, and the other thing, but it is, there's a reality to it that we've got to acknowledge. Number two, it's complicated. And I used that one last week and I'll foreshadow when I talk politics, I will use that word again. And by complicated, I mean sin in, in our world makes things that we really can't figure out. That's what sin does. And if we could figure it out really easily and untangle it, sin just wouldn't be very powerful and we wouldn't need a savior and an execution on a cross and a resurrection from the dead. We wouldn't need all that. It's very complicated. And yet we tend to go talk about this in very simplistic ways with very simplistic solutions and very simplistic decisions for what other people should do and shouldn't do. And it's very clear from our perspective, but it is complicated. And that should really uh, adjust how we think and talk about it. And it relates to number three, limited. You and I are limited in what we know. Now we all say, yeah, I know that, but let me sharpen it a little bit. What you think you know now, you know a lot less than what you think you know, okay? This is why I tell myself, this is what we should all tell ourselves when we get up in the morning and go through our day. All right, I know I don't know everything, but I know a lot more than everybody else. No, you don't, okay? So our knowledge is limited. And it's limited in a way where we really have to respect that reality and respect uh, the choices other people make and why they make them. And uh, we'll talk more about how anger can enter there and what we need to do with it. But as you and I make choices, we cannot pretend we are qualified to make choices for everyone. So with that in mind, let's look at our scripture that I chose for today. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Paul says, man, if, if, 
you believe, if you're a Christ follower and you believe he's really the savior and you really believe that your belief causes the spirit to indwell you and that creates any mercy, any sympathy. If you, there's a hint of that, then keep going down that road and complete Paul's joy, which would complete God's joy, and do uh, these three, four things. Have a same mind, same love, full accord, one mind. Now, these four things are kind of <laughs> the same, right? And the first one and the last one, same mind and one mind. And then in the middle, same love, full accord. It's kind of a sandwich of like ideas. Paul says, gives us this four facets of this because he wants us to really get this type of unity. And until that happens, joy is not complete. We are not lone rangers. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And it's in our unity that he is made known because it's only through forgiveness and repentance can you and I be unified? So he wants us to get at this. In fact, we must get this if we're going to be a church. And the grumbling and complaining and, and posturing and uh, even the quiet thought that I'm thinking better than everybody else here is poison. And when something like this comes, how we go through it together is more important than just picking the right strategy, particularly when nobody really knows the right strategy. So four times. Well, does this mean you and I never have a disagreement on anything? No, it does not mean that. In fact, the Church of Jesus Christ should be able to live quite happily and harmoniously with differing opinions at a certain level amongst ourselves. But on the essential things, we're of the same mind, we're of one mind, full accord, same love. Let me give you an example of how this can happen. Last week, I, our second part on race, I interviewed a friend of mine, Alton Hardy. And it was the second interview I did with him here. And um, he talked about a lot of different things. But also back a few months ago when the Minneapolis riots began, I came in at the end of the week uh, on a Friday and I interviewed two other friends of mine from town here, Joe Jones and Pastor Nate Moody, both from Brown Hutcherson and both of them city councilmen for the city of Grand Rapids. Now, if you saw both of Alton's interviews, saw my sermon and saw that interview, you would find amongst the three guys I interviewed, you would find differences in their opinions and perspectives on a number of topics. And you may even find from my teaching a difference of opinion yet again. So why do this? Because we're all of the same mind and, and the same love. So at the end of the day, even though our perspectives and positions on certain things may differ, we all agree that the essence of the problem of our culture is that it does not know and love God. And the answer is for people to come to know Christ as their Savior. And that only happens through repentance. And then as we're forgiven, we live a life of forgiveness. See, all four of us are on the same page there. And yet it manifests itself differently on different topics, but we come back to the same thing. And in that, that allows us to be really good friends and to have full accord and the same love and to have lunch together and to hear differing opinions and be okay with that. The church of Jesus Christ must be okay when people express different opinions at a certain level. It's our unity. 
particularly when things are, are, are so complicated, confusing, and our knowledge is limited. Well, what blocks this unity? Well, Paul's going to tell us, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. So what blocks this unity? Selfish ambition and conceit. It's that simple. Now, there's a type of ambition, which is good. We, we're on a mission here as the church. We want to grow the kingdom of God. We're ambitious about that. But Paul is telling us of talking about selfish ambition. And selfish ambition implies a competition between you and me. If you win, you get ahead, I lose. And so selfish ambition, I'm always posturing and I need to get ahead of you. I've got to win the argument. I've got to have the better article. I've got to, I've got to have the better position. I've got to do more research. Because somehow internally, I feel like I'm positioning myself as a more important and noteworthy person. And conceit is we actually think we can do this and we should do this. And we know best, and our data is best, and our sources are the best, and our insight's the best. My news station's better. My podcasts are better. When yours are stunted and broken and limited, and so are you. Oh. Paul says, when we go there, when that comes, we have blocked the opportunity to be unified in a way that brings joy to the Father and life to the world. And Paul goes on, he wants to continue to shape our thinking and he wants us to be forward looking. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay, we can't have selfish ambition and conceit Consider others better than ourselves. We're to take care of our own interests. There is room for self-interest. However, when my interest in myself puts a shadow over your interest, I've blocked. And I am to know you and try and understand you and what your interests are so I can raise them up and attend to them. It's not all about me. My life's not about me. It's about you. It's about serving. And self-interest is necessary, but not at the expense of others. And to think win-win. And Paul, as we, he, he says, I'm gonna, I want you to get a picture in your mind that you can look at and shape how you behave. So he gives us this clear lens to look through. Have this in mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Paul says, okay, everybody, Get in your mind, Jesus. He's a real person. Think about him. He's the, the main shape of our lens. He's our model. And what does he say? What, what's this? Did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped? Oh, you see, when you think about Jesus, he was God. He had access to the full power of God. And he didn't use it. He chose not to use it. Well, what if he did choose to use it? Well, if, if Christ had grasped all the power he had, he never would have been imprisoned and never would have been executed. And because he grasped all that power and he's God uh, and he's holy, that means no one, no holiness can be near him. If he grasped the power, he would have no choice but to destroy us because of his perfect character. But he did something remarkable. 
he had the power of God and he set it aside. And that allowed him to go to the cross so we could have eternal life. But it was a choice. And when you and I have any type of power, our propensity is to exert it. And when we don't have power and decisions are made that we don't like, we scream, <laughs> we get angry, we thrash out, we send, make, send tweets, we send emails, Facebook posts. So much of it is just our quest for power and we want to wield it. But Jesus chose not to. And in that, Paul is saying, you church must get this in our minds. Because instead, Jesus did this. He went and emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Well, what does that mean? He emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? He emptied himself of power. Well, where did it go? <laughs> it went into his church. And it's this process by thinking about power being, I empty myself of power. And you see, if we're, we're emptied of our power to be over people, then things like conceit and selfish ambition are gone. And Christ always did this, so he didn't have conceit or selfish ambition to get rid of, but you and I have plenty. And ambition doesn't sacrifice and conceit can't forgive. And so he gave power away. And so this is a good word for us all to apply to ourselves. Empty. To think about what does it mean for me to empty myself of power? Well, all those grudges you have in your family, gone. Gone. <laughs> Those people, you, those neighbors you dislike or you feel competitive with or that friend you feel competitive with, gone. That's power. And power, once the power goes, our ambition and our conceit go down. And to make that move toward powerlessness, then we listen instead of telling. And this culture is tell, 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 tell. And we become people who deal direct with one another versus gossiping. And we wait to hear and understand other stories and other perspectives versus acting out. And we're honest. We're not political and not saying what we really think and maybe even taking pride in our ability to make everybody happy. But Jesus emptied himself, why? So he could serve. And how far did he go with this? And being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul's, <laughs> it's okay. Get Jesus in your mind. He's emptying himself of power. What does that mean? It means the guy who created the universe and could certainly bring it to a close allowed his own creation to take him, arrest him, beat him, spit on him, and execute him for the sake of humanity so we could believe and live. That's how far. So get this picture in your mind, church, because we, we tend to um, draw a pretty quick line as to how far we should go. Now, we don't have to be executed on a cross. 
In fact, and we can't certainly do it the way Jesus did because he was perfect and it doesn't need to be done again. But Paul's giving us this picture for us to weigh pretty heavily how far we will go in our love for other people. How much can I take from you? That seems so wrong, so stupid, so offensive. So when we look at all three of these subjects, race, COVID, politics, we must have a temperament that orders our loves and understands the world in a way that is like Christ. And we're gonna absorb pain for the sake of other people, for the good of the world, because so much more was done for us by him. And really, when you look at all as I'm examining, oh, these are three different topics, but they just met, they run into each other like a you know, huge mess. But at their core, at the core, when we think about being a church and how to move through all of these, they all come down to the same core. What does it mean to be human? What is the value of other people? Where does it come from? The formal word is anthropology. They're all about the human person. Who am I and who are you and who are all these people on my uh, computer screen? And what's it all about? Where's it heading? It all comes down to the human person who's created, fallen, but has the chance for redemption through faith. So in this, we see here a second word for self-application is humble. Now, if I said, hey, as soon as service is done, in the first 15 minutes of service, everybody go out and do something humble. What would you do? Well, you can't do something to be humble, right? And if you say, well, I'm going to do this to be humble, it instantaneously becomes not humble. See, the uh, humble humility is the letting go of, of something. The, the demand of being right, the demand of having things our way, the demand that I must think I'm superior to you. And I release that ambition and I release the conceit because it's a lie and it's empty. And so as we enter these, those daily decision-making and discussions over pandemic and the, all the decisions that includes, we must have humility. But we must empty ourselves first to have that humility because humility situates, situates us to serve in the best interest of other people. So when we think about the human person being at the center of this, there are many facets to a human person. And there, when we think about the pandemic, there are some major facets of the human person that come into play here as we think about how to handle this, what's going on and what to do. And the key as I go through these different facets is, our temptation is to look through one facet and focus on that and make our decisions on that and alienate people because of our one dimensionality. So the first facet obviously is health. This is a virus. It's real. It's affecting people. People are getting sick. People are dying. People are having lasting side effects. We don't know where it's going to go. But the, the thing with the health is uh, a big chunk of that is measurable. And so we can click on a screen and see how many have been infected and how many have died in the world and the country and the state and the county and the zip code. And we can look at these graphs and, and we, we can measure it. And this is an important aspect for us to analyze what to do and think about what to do. But it is not the only one. So sometimes, particularly in the news, you'll hear politicians say, well, I'm just going to follow the science. 
Whose science? And is that really the only aspect? Because it's not, but it's an important one. There's another aspect, it's economic. And oftentimes there's an attempt to divide these. And if you talk about the economics and job loss and, and people say, some people over here may uh, say, well, you're, you're just choosing money over life. Really? Is what you do for a living and earn a living, is that an important part of your life? If you couldn't work anymore in your life, would that affect your humanity? Yes. These two are so intimately linked that to separate them is to do grave harm. And you could separate it from this angle too. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, the government will take care of us. They'll just give us stimuluses. That's not real money. We're just borrowing from our future. That work has to be done. How long can you do that? Probably not as long as we've done it. So these are both facets have to be looked at. And there's a third aspect. How about mental health? Okay, I can measure this somewhat. I can measure this somewhat. Ooh, I can, this one's getting tougher to measure. Loneliness, anxiety, depression, alcoholism, suicides. This is real. This is happening. How long can we be alone? How long can we be um, in, in fear? And, and I don't know. We all have different levels of what we can do. Some people have thrived in, in lockdown. Other people have shriveled. But those things are strong. Fourth aspect, ah, the social. Just being out and about together, seeing each other, not just seeing each other, but seeing each other's whole face. <laughs> How do I measure that? I don't know. I don't have a meter for that. But so much of how you and I communicate is done in our facial expressions, that there must be some detriment and some harm in doing this over a long period of time. How long? I don't know. How much harm? I don't know. But I don't want to ignore it either. And so sometimes there'll be slogans out there, uh, you know, love your neighbor, wear a mask. Is that always true? And doesn't that kind of infer if you're not wearing a mask, you don't love your neighbor? Or Jesus would wear a mask. Would he? Always? Everywhere? I don't know. How do people know that? And does that really help us? It's complex. There are good reasons for some to not wear a mask. So a fifth aspect civic. What about our freedoms? Aren't you concerned that our freedoms are being taken away from us? Well, yes, I'm always concerned with freedoms being taken away from me. And I think some of the things that have been done by our government uh, are scary. They're not anything compared to what was done to Christ yet, though. So, I got to be concerned, but not in a way that blocks me from understanding the mission of Christ through his church. And so, yes, I think freedom, religious freedom, liberty is important. But there are other liberties taken away that we don't always care a whole lot about. The single greatest liberty taken from people in this country is abortion. How, you know, what do we do? How much does that concern me versus being told to wear a mask at the grocery store? And the single greatest oppression on humanity is our own sin. 
How many people do I talk to about that reality versus spouting off about my opinions about our government? Is it important? Yes, it's not ultimate. It's got to be kept in its right place. And that brings me to a sixth facet, and it's the spiritual. Now, when you look at all the businesses and the government and how many of them talk about the spiritual aspect of this? None, virtually none. <laughs> and yet the church is here to say, this is what it's all about. <laughs> and this is under our care. And we, as the people of God, we wrestle with all of these knowing that ultimately the spiritual life of every individual is the greatest thing. COVID can only take your life in this world. Sin takes your life for all eternity. We've got to wrestle with all of these knowing this is Number one, if you and I enter this in our private life or as we talk and we just go through one lens, we tend to get frustrated and angry and we lose sight of this. We can't lose sight of this. And if we have sight of this, we'll be unified. We may have different conclusions at some level, but we won't be angry or feel superior to each other. So as a church, we wrestle with this as church leadership. We talk about this every day. We wrestle with it over and over and over again. We're like all of you. We're all exhausted talking about this. But it's there every day. And it's a, you know, an opportunity to be light to the world. So we, we embrace it. But it's difficult. And so we reach conclusions. Eventually, you've got to do something. When do we open church? How do we open church? What do we do with our live stream? And how long? And, and so everything we're doing is we're trying to wrestle with these realities, knowing some people have made the choice to be here in person. Some have made the choice to stay uh, online. We totally get that. And we, what we've done is we've tried to make different options that allow us to all focus on the spiritual, even if we have different opinions. Do I know whether we are making the best decisions every time? I, have, I don't know, but neither does anybody else. So other churches may wrestle with this and come down on a different position. Some churches, some very big churches around the country are closed still. That's okay. I assume they're wrestling like we're wrestling, came down in another spot, but we're to be of one mind, the same mind, the same love, one accord. And so this is how we go through it. And we've got to go through it well. So we can have that one mind that is always focused on the most important thing. So a few guidelines before we close in prayer for life-giving movement. So we're supposed to empty, be humble, and, uh, and we're supposed to move. And so my first guideline is read and watch less. Good luck with that. I, I read and watch a ton. And has it helped me? No, it doesn't. But it has blocked me from reading and doing some other things. And it, it gets fear and anger going quite a bit. Read less, watch less, pray more. Find ways to pray in everyday parts of life. That it's not just the prayer time in a time slot. 
it's when you're doing certain things, you do certain kind of prayers. And particularly as anger and different things, I have zero anger here, no anger. When you feel anger, when you feel that little superiority, when you roll your eyes, we're on the road to being part of the darkness, not the light. And when that happens, just Paul says, our mind is supposed to go over here, but we've got to know how to change our mind. And it's through the word, the spirit, and the people of God. And so take specific scriptures. Take the scripture we're talking about today and pray it back. Read it and then pray it back to God. As we do that, it actually changes our mindset. Our anger and fear come down. People are greater, more important than positions. Where you land on this is not the ultimate thing. It's, it's people. It's always a people thing. How do we love people through this? And, and the last one, I want to give a, a caveat. Unity is greater than correctness. Now, my caveat is this. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about being correct about the non-negotiables, the deity of Christ, the nature of the Trinity, the sanctity of the word. But unity is greater than my personal correctness on issues. So you want to have a different opinion? You want to have a discussion about it? So do I. Let's talk about it. You say what you think, I'll say what I think. And if they're different, it's okay. Because in the new heaven and new earth, we'll look back and we'll just marvel at how the, God was good, even in the midst of that. And we're going to look back and want to have been a light for his kingdom when we look back on who we were and what we were doing, what we were saying. And so for this week, our next step is the third word, and it's serve. So as we empty, it brings us to a position of humility, which is a place of service, and then find a way to serve. Many of you have already done it. You do it here, you do it in your neighborhoods, you do it at work. If, if you can't be out and about, that's okay. There are ways to serve even in a lockdown, which many of you have learned and lived out. A friend of mine said, she read an article and the author said, you know, five years from now, what do we wish, what are we gonna think we wish we would have done today? trying to anticipate that in a way that makes us do something now. But we first, we've got to empty ourselves of power, conceit, selfish, and ambition. Then a humble state emerges, and then we're ready to serve in his name. But that'll be obvious by our unity and our love for each other. All right, stand. We're going to close in prayer. You're a great church. You've done a lot of, in the name of Christ in a very difficult time. Let's keep it up. Please pray this closing psalm with me. Follow with me. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Have a great Sabbath.